to my mind, it's the greatest job in the world. It's exciting, it takes you places, it takes you around the world, you see the movers and shakers. It's a constant test. You know, I've always said to my colleagues that the day I walk into a booth, switch on the microphone without having butterflies in my stomach is the day I'm going to look for another job. What I like most about my profession is the fact that it allows me glimpses of so many different worlds. I love the fact when I realize that people have actually understood something thanks to me. And I do like being in those meetings, small meetings between heads of states where perhaps there's no one else there except the interpreter. And you're so privileged to be there and, and hear them and see how they think. But you have to remember that it's because you're an interpreter. It's not because of who you are as a person. It's because it's your job. So you can't be a, a prima donna. The interpreter is a go-between, is a mediator between those who speak in one language and the others who actually understand in another language. And so I believe the interpreters have a primordial role to play in bridging the gap among cultures and civilizations. It's a visit that's designed to deliver, in practice, on the political will we have repeatedly expressed. Of course we have a great interest, even an ideological interest, in serving the institution of universal governance at this point in time. There are more similarities between the European Parliament and the United Nations. Both are parliamentary assemblies and both are multilingual parliamentary assemblies. The European Parliament suffers from the lack of interpreters, as we do, suffers from the lack of translators, as the United Nations does. There's a shortage of interpreters for certain languages, like Slovenian or Maltese. But there's equally a shortage of interpreters for languages that are common to both institutions, like English, French, Russian and Arabic, which is not an official EU language, but which we use on a very regular basis. Here are the, the weak spots of the system, and this is, this is a problem throughout the world, actually. It's not just us, it's also the European Union, the Parliament. Uh, we, together, uh, as uh, a family of conference management, we realized that we have to really attack this problem proactively, because the market doesn't really provide the necessary supply anymore. In comparison to the European Parliament, ours is a very small operation. We, we work with only six languages. For the historical reasons, the UN has kept to six languages, though incidentally it started out with five, English, French, Spanish, Russian and Chinese. These were either languages that were very widely spoken around the world, or in the case of Chinese, the language of a large country, a major power. Arabic was added subsequently as it was considered important as a language spoken in many countries around the world. This adds up to a total of 30 language combinations, whereas the Parliament works with 23 official languages, soon to be 24, which adds up to 506 language combinations for the time being. So it's just a question of scale, but in essence we are the same. Periodically, sort of look at what each other is doing uh, and we compare our workload standards, our quality standards. How do we guarantee that our customers feel assured that there's a quality monitoring scheme in place and that they can have total confidence in the quality of interpreting we provide? This is especially important in organizations like the one I work in at the moment, a tribunal. And not just any old tribunal, but a criminal tribunal with defendants facing life imprisonment. So everything that's said absolutely has to be interpreted as accurately as possible and as correctly as possible so that you are not the cause of, say, a miscarriage of justice. We agree on adjustments and harmonization of, uh, of work, which is extremely necessary because the world of interpretation and translation is, is a global market now. We have a scheme whereby European Parliament staff interpreters go to the UN during the General Assembly to work in the booth. By the same token, UN interpreters come to us for a month or six weeks and work in the plenary session as well as in committee meetings and political group meetings.
It is one of the most sensitive weeks that we have, definitely one of the busiest weeks we have. Almost all the world's heads of state and government all convene in New York at the same time. There's also media frenzy, and essentially it means that as interpreters we don't have a life for a week. We have about 110 meetings this week, which is very unusual for us. I mean, our limit is about 80, 90, so 110 is, is a lot more than we do. It means we have to be ready for constant changes. Uh, the, the program of work changes uh, six, seven, ten times a day. Our booking system works either over the phone or over the internet. And usually at eight o'clock in the evening, you, you log on and you see what your assignments are for the next morning and possibly for the next afternoon. The agenda can change from one minute to the next. You never quite know which speech is coming when, which country is coming when. You can be reassigned from one minute to the next. So basically you have to be very agile, you have to be ready to face any changes at any time and uh, do it with a smile. Well, the obvious European Parliament equivalent to the United Nations General Assembly is the plenary session. We currently have around 380 staff interpreters across all the booths. During a plenary week, interpreter numbers go up to the 1,000 mark. In fact, two-thirds of our interpreting requirements are covered by freelance interpreters, by which I mean self-employed interpreters. There is another very important field of cooperation uh, between us, which uh, has already started, but I would like to see it expanded and I'd like it to, to see it uh, thrive, which is uh, the training field. We've thought about the need and the scope for the European Parliament and the UN to pool our resources to fund interpreter training. Because if you look at Africa now, we're having to use European or American interpreters to meet the demand. As someone who works in an organization that uh, has said that multilingualism is something to be respected and to be maintained at all times, uh, I do not believe there should be a single language in the world, English or any other language. Um, language is something to do with identity, it is something to do with heritage, it's something to do with cultural background, and it is something to do with the democratic nature of the institutions for which we work. Le fait the fact that in the European Parliament, each and every representative, each and every member can speak his or her native language enables us to ensure that members of Parliament are elected not on the basis of their language skills, but because citizens trust them. But first and foremost, the fact that all members of Parliament can speak their mother tongue and that what they say is interpreted into all the other languages means that citizens in my country, for example, can follow what I'm doing and so can assess the actions of the person they have elected to stand up for their interests. And they can also follow what I'm saying and what all the others are saying in the debate. And that's why this is a key plank in the democratic functioning of our institutions. A statement which, by the way, also applies to a very large extent to the UN.